tonight, as advertised, joining me now is Gilbert Bennett, the uh, Vice President of the Lower Churchill Project with NALCOR. G- good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Pete. How are you today? Wonderful. I appreciate you uh, giving us some time here today. Oh, not a problem. Now, I stirred up, uh, I guess, a little bit of things. I'm not the only one, obviously, but uh, just asking some more questions about, uh, you know, the uh, the two plans that were evaluated, the Muskrat Falls Project versus the Isolated Island uh, case. And asking, uh, first of all, maybe you can clear this up for us, uh, the cost that came in for the isolated island case, was that to produce the same amount of power that Muskrat Falls offers, or, or were we looking more for exactly what we actually need in terms of uh, replacing Holyrood or whatever for the future, or are they, just, are they the same? No, they're, uh, you're, you're right. The, the second one is, is the accurate, is, is exactly what we're looking to. Let's mm-hmm. look at the forecasted requirements that we have on the island. Mm-hmm. And then put together a scenario, one isolated and then one with muskrat, mm-hmm. to meet that demand. Mm-hmm. Right. So if we look at our long-term load forecast, we look at you know the addition of the valet facility, for example, in uh, in Long Harbor in that forecast. Mm-hmm. And then faced with that forecast, put together a generation expansion plan that meets those forecasted requirements. So we didn't start with muskrat falls and say let's make this much energy. Mm-hmm. We actually said let's look at the cost of muskrat falls and then look at the demand on the island and how to meet that demand. Now, are, are we not still going to be maintaining some of the power generated at Holyrood as backup for the uh, somewhat vulnerable transmission system from Muskrat Falls? It's not really all about replacing entirely Holyrood, is it? Uh, in the long term, after uh, three or four years when we have uh, solid operational experience with the new system, we will stop producing uh, at Holyrood. But the, the existing 40-year-old plant will be uh, will be decommissioned. There are some electrical components in the plant that we're going to use, but the fuel-burning side of that plant will be decommissioned. Entirely. There will be nothing, uh, nothing produced at Holyrood whatsoever after well, that short a time frame. Right. The new, the new gas turbine that's, uh, that's at the PUB right now will be located at Holyrood. Mm-hmm. That's a, a new piece of equipment that we're going to use really to meet our, meet our peak demands. So when we look at the transmission line, uh, a mountain of effort has gone into uh, designing that line to meet the, the climatic conditions and meteorological conditions we have across the 1,100-kilometer long line. Uh, there are lots of places there we have we have significant operational experience of our own, uh, and we have a you know a very solid uh, engineering design for that facility. So you know the reliability of that line is something that we paid a lot of attention to in the design phase of the project. So things have changed since the evaluation by the third party on that line because they said there were some danger that uh, there could be interruptions for uh, significant periods of time. Well, we always we always plan for contingency. So when Manitoba Hydro looked at that in the DG3 review, uh, they found that the uh, transmission line was robust, uh, built to you know appropriate standards, and uh, you know they they did recommend that we continue to make sure that we're planned planning operationally in order to deal with, uh, you know, an unlikely event on that line. In other words, having spare parts, having the crews available to uh, to restore the line. But they concluded at DG3 uh, in the review in 2012 that they were they were quite pleased with the uh, with the line design. All right, so really, uh, what is the backup then, uh, given that there's still things can happen that we can't predict, per, or, you know, we could have a confluence of, uh, uh, of uh, factors that uh, conspire to thwart us even after the most careful uh, uh, precautions. Uh, w- what is the backup for the transmission lines from Muskrat Falls? So for the, for the transmission line uh, from Muskrat, the first thing we know about that line is that we can actually operate with one of the conductors out of service. So we build, uh, we build uh, redundancy into the line itself. It's, it's unlike our other transmission lines that actually have to have all of the conductors in place. That's one thing that we have. Uh, we have a spare cable in Strait of Belle Isle to deal with an unlikely uh, event there. We have uh, a robust engineering design structurally. Uh, beyond that, we have our generating resources on the island. We have reserve in the system. We'll continue to maintain reserve. Uh, in addition to that, we have the ability to import from the Maritimes. So we can pull at least 300 megawatts in from the Maritime provinces in order to uh, in order to meet our demand. So we look at all of those alternatives. Uh, you look at the probability of uh, of an event happening, the duration of that event, and then uh, and then to uh, you know look at the probability of an outage, build a reserve accordingly in order to meet a uh, required um, service standard. 
All right, let's just go now to the uh, uh, editorial in the paper today where they're comparing essentially uh, you know, Muskrat Falls with some other projects, and I guess we could compare it against the Upper Churchill as well. It, it does seem to be, because of the nature of the project and where it's positioned and the uh, infrastructure that has to be built you know, to, uh, to start things off here, to be a, an awful lot of money for the amount of power being realized. Uh, is there any, uh, I guess... Uh, gain or, or, or advantage to c- doing this kind of comparison at all? Should we feel a little bit uh, uh, uneasy about the cost of it compared to what we're going to be uh, able to realize power-wise out of it? Well, let's let's look at uh, maybe the two uh, the two um, projects in Quebec. I mean, primarily uh, East Main and Romaine are relatively close to existing transmission facilities. They're built primarily in HQ's case for export markets. Mm-hmm. Uh, their business case is different than ours. So we're here looking at our domestic needs on the island, and we need to ask ourselves, you know, with the alternatives that are available to us, with our geographical market reality, what's our least cost option? Um, we've looked at that business case, assuming that we're not getting any revenue from exports, right? That even though there's a surplus of energy from Muscat Falls in the short term, we have not included any revenue for that in our business case. So in that regard, you know, it's, it's, um, it's our analysis based on our own domestic needs. I mean, it's sort of like saying, well, I need to buy a house in St. John's, but house prices in Cornerbrook look really attractive. It's not really helping our problem here. Um, all of the costs of Muskrat Falls and the transmission link are, are, are considered in our domestic analysis. Now, we concluded that that's the least cost alternative. Now, with that done, with the transmission interconnections in place, we have a surplus of energy available from Muskrat Falls in the short term. We can get that to market. And we'll be highly competitive in that market because all of our costs are covered. Uh, there's revenue that's going to be derived from that surplus energy. We bring that back to the province, and then somebody's going to make a decision what to do with that. Does, does the government take it and use it to offset uh, services for, for government services, infrastructure, social services, health care, and so on? Or do we plow it back into electricity rates? Now, from my perspective as project developer, I'm just happy to see you know, that revenue coming back. Somebody needs to make a policy decision as to where it goes. But... I guess where I'm going with this is that our business case for Muskrat Falls is, is, is a quite different set of considerations and questions than what Hydro-Quebec would, would develop in order to build a predominantly export scenario in, in their marketplace. Right. And, of course, uh, it begs the question of what we'll be discussing, I suppose, if and when we get to Gull Island, which some suggest will be sooner rather than later. Uh, You know, uh, can we go down this road again, or could we? Uh, I hate to ask you to speculate so far off, but, uh, you know, is this something we can duplicate, or will we have to be looking at something completely different in that instance? Well, I think there's, you know, there's a a portfolio of opportunities emerging. I don't say which one is, is better than the other, but certainly we see, you know, continued interest in, in exploration and mineral development in Labrador. Uh, we have a high degree of interest in uh, the New England marketplace. I don't think Ontario is out of the woods with their nuclear fleet. Uh, and then finally, even looking at the maritime provinces, uh, there are still continued issues, uh, you know, in the maritime provinces, whether it's the back to quack generating facility in New Brunswick, the continued reliance on thermal generation in Nova Scotia. So there's still opportunities there. Uh, you know, you'd like to think that at some point in time we'll see some, you know, commercial uh, movement with HQ. Their, I mean, their situation is continuing to evolve. They have interest in developing uh, northeastern Quebec the same way that we do for mining. You know, you'd like to think that there's some commercial common sense going to prevail there at some point in time. So when you look at all those opportunities, uh, those are, that's why we have, a, you know, a team continuing to assess opportunities for Gull Island. All right, um, I had uh, one more question for you now, and I was just listening to your last question. I'm not sure if I... Oh, yes, I wanted to ask you about wind power and what percentage of our total amount of produced power in the province, where are we at in terms of wind power? It can go to what? About 20% is usually the uh, expected standard if you're going to build up your wind power to be a part of the piece? Well, if you're, yeah, if you're interconnected to, uh, to neighboring systems... You can you can certainly get to twenty percent. Uh, here in our situation today, we're isolated from the rest of the grid. So I mean, our our demand in the summer is probably one quarter what we would see in the winter. Mm-hmm. So you know, we have we have two two situations. One is um, dealing with that that period of low demand, in mm-hmm. which case we would likely have to curtail the wind, and then certainly in the winter, you know, when we have we have greater demand, you'd like to have more wind on board, but. We don't have the ability to easily integrate that into the system. And what I mean by that is, you know, what happens when the wind doesn't blow? Mm -hmm. So if the wind stops blowing, uh, you know, we could be out a couple hundred megawatts of generation. 
you've got to back that up, and there's a capital cost and an operating cost that goes with that. So it's a, a technical and economic question. In the in the isolated case, so in the in the MHI report, we looked in there, and there's 200 and 200 and some odd megawatts in addition to the uh, 50 that we have today. So they looked at that and said that's a reasonable place to get in the isolated system over a period of time. Mm-hmm. Now with with muskrat in place, we can actually integrate quite a bit of wind because the um, the units of muskrat falls are highly flexible, can operate at low output, can operate at high output, and can actually follow the wind and uh, and integrate fairly handily with the uh, you know, with the interconnected system. Do you see, I mean, you, we constantly hear of new uh, techniques and technology that may be able to store the energy that wind can produce, uh, you know, if we don't need it at the time. It can be uh, put on reserve, uh, uh, become, uh, I suppose, uh, in a way, kinetic energy by pumping it upstream and hydro dams, etc. Uh, do you see that uh, down the road, uh, as technology seems to be increasing in an exponential way, uh, do you see more potential for wind to be added and uh, uh, more used to be made of it down the road? Well, we'll be, we'll be well positioned with the, with the technology that we're building today. So with Muskrat Falls and with the transmission link and with water management across the entire system, we're actually very well positioned to put a fair amount of wind on the system. And I think at that point in time, you know, when we look at that from an energy marketing perspective, someone will say, well, should I build wind? Is that the cheapest energy I can get? Are there other hydro opportunities? Or do we, in fact, import from the market on an offbeat basis and store that energy? So having the transmission interconnections, having the flexibility in, in, the, uh, in the units of Muskrat Falls will actually let us put several hundred megawatts of wind on the system. So, you know, the, the technology that we have without even going to, you know, battery storage and some of those solutions, we, we will have a highly flexible, highly efficient solution uh, with the hydro facilities that we have in the, we will have in the system after Muskrat goes in service. Okay, and we'll have to leave the other questions. I had some connected to the Russell Wangerski uh, article as well, the column, uh, but perhaps we can leave that to another day. I really appreciate your time today, sir. Um, by all means, if you have anything to bring to us, we'd be more than uh, happy to have you on the program at any time. That's great, Pete. Thanks so much. All the best. Have a good day.